Well, school's uh, <clears throat> back in session for everybody. Uh, some people are happy, some aren't, so sorry about that, but it'll, and joyful for those that enjoy it. But if we can remember back uh, maybe to when we were in school, or if you're in school now, uh, maybe think of science class. And, uh, you know, we, we learned several things in science through the years, and one of the things we learned was uh, the law of cause and effect. I don't know if you've gotten there yet, right? But we learned that when certain things happen, it has effect on other things. And we learned uh, through those great little experiments when heat is put on ice, ice melts. When a uh, cold front passes a warm front in the summer, many times we get a thunderstorm. When we get remnants of a tropical storm that comes up to Virginia, we get a couple of days of soaking constant rain. And unfortunately, when storms brew in the Atlantic and they begin to pass over warm waters, they can develop a powerful storm that gets circular and just keeps moving and strengthening and we call that a hurricane. I'm not sure why we've never called them hemicanes, but I'll leave that to, um, to your discussions around the dinner table. Uh, but, you know, we have this cause and effect, and we know that, that even in life and, and even spiritually, that begins to happen as well. Uh, the Bible tells us there's cause and effect. When we sin, the wages of sin spiritually is death. The Bible says if we sow kindness, the effect is we'll reap kindness. If we practice hate, then probably we will not receive much love in life. And then in, in science too, there's this sense of wonderment. And uh, when, when we learn or have you experienced something in life or remember discovering something in life that's just so miraculous, it just astounds you. Uh, maybe in science, I remember those first times that I was introduced like to a microscope. And you know, they, they said, here's this little drop of pond water, doesn't look like much. Now look at this pond water under this microscope. And you look under the microscope, and man, you see all these organism and these wiggly things going around, and you say, wow. That's, a, you know, that is amazing, and, and we just don't, we don't understand it at that moment, but it's something that, that we really have to begin to think about and, and, and process of what's happening. Well, in this passage today from Mark, we see both of those things happening. Uh, Mark says right at the beginning when I began reading, in six days, Jesus takes uh, Peter, James, and John up on top of a mountain. It's six days since Peter has said for the whole group when Jesus said, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's a, a under the microscope moment. Wow, that's a revelation. That's something that's astounding. But as we know, looking from this side to them, the disciples just don't understand that fully. What does all of this mean? And so now Jesus takes a few of them up to the top of a mountain, and they are going to observe something, experience something, that, that man, they, that just blows their mind, that they just don't understand. They're going to see Jesus, what we call transfigured. They're going to see Elijah and Moses uh, join him. And, and they're also going to begin to hear Jesus talk about something of dying and rising again and resurrection. And even the passage we read today, they're even saying, what does this mean, rising from the dead? We just sang that beautiful song, O Glorious Day. We've been singing about it and studying about it and worshiping Christ most of our lives about it, and uh, we, we think we kind of comprehend that. I hope it really hasn't dulled our, our wonder, our senses in our own minds, in our own hearts, 
But yet you can imagine when the disciples start hearing about this, they just don't know what to think. But what the transfiguration means and is about, it's about cause and effect. Because Jesus is the Son of God, because of what Jesus is going to do, it's going to have some effects on the world. It's going to have some effects on you personally. It's going to have an effect on everything going forward in world history. And let's see what Jesus is talking about and what this means. One of the first things that happens up on this mountain is that Moses and Elijah appears. And they appear, and they are two that represents the highest of God's revelation to man and women up to this point in history. This is how God has revealed himself. Moses was there, and, and Moses was, we know from our Bible study, one that, that came and delivered the nation of Israel, that early nation, from the bondage in Egypt, right? He delivered them into freedom. They became a great nation. Through the Lord, he, he helped release the chains of pain and suffering. He was the first chain breaker that we sang about this morning. In that sense, it was literal change, wasn't it? It was literal pain. And he delivers the people of God from that. But most importantly, he, he helps establish the covenant with God that men and women would have a way to have a relationship with God, a way that would last for centuries and centuries and centuries. God gave Moses what? You know, the law. The Ten Commandments on top of a mountain, just where Jesus and his disciples are now. Now, it was a conditional law. And, and what I mean by that, that it was a law that said the way that, that you can relate to God, the way that, that God can forgive you, the way that, that you can feel at peace in your spirit is that if you do exactly what God says through this law, if uh, you do good, then you're in good relationship with God. But if you don't do what this law says, uh, that, that you're not in right relationship with God. A lot of this, the law said, depends on you. If you do good, you're good. If you do bad, you're bad. But that was the first basis of us knowing God, that, that God demands a lot from us. It was conditioned on what we did. Now, along with Moses, there stood Elijah. We, we know the stories of Elijah. He was the first in, in line of the great, great prophets. He, he's considered by Israel really the greatest of all the prophets, isn't he? He was a champion for God. He was zealous in, in demanding that we worship God and we follow God no matter what. Uh, he did great, great miracles, you know, defeating those prophets of Baal. Um, you know, all of, the, uh, all of the great, astounding miracles that nobody had ever seen before. He was powerful. And he reminded us along, along the other prophets that came along that God demands justice, that God demands righteousness, that God is worthy to be worshipped, and that God has an even greater plan coming down the pipe. So these two giants of faith come from the heavens and they gather with Jesus on this mountain for the disciples to see. And the Bible says that that in Matthew, that they're talking to Jesus about his impending death on the cross and his resurrection, almost like they're there to encourage him from heaven, a message from God. And then the transfiguration happens. And what we mean is that even though all three of them were there, Jesus outshines them all, doesn't he? Jesus outshines them both, Moses and Elijah, on that mountain. And in the end of the passage, only Jesus was left. Only he was shining. As great in Mo as Moses, as great as Elijah were, they were only preparing the world 
for the great true revelation of God, and that's Jesus Christ. They only pointed to Jesus. They only pointed to what the, the greatness, the all-inspiring plan that God had. Their job was ending on that mountain, and the final plan and the redemption of God was taking place in Jesus. The true picture of God is in Jesus Christ, isn't it? We no longer need to look at the past, at, at, at maybe some of those things we don't understand in the Old Testament, those, those gruesome stories, those annihilations of nations and people, um, of the harshness of not following the law. But a new day is coming, a new picture of God's love and, and, and God's grace, and, and soon we can just look to Jesus for who God really is. And today, just as, as those old traditions of, of the law, the new of the Old Testament fades away, it's the same with our lives, our new lives as Christians. When Christ becomes real to us, when we accept Christ in our life, the same thing happens. The old, our old thoughts begin to fade away. The things we once thought that were urgent and important become meaningless in the sight of Jesus. The, maybe some of the hate or unforgiveness or stuckness we have in relationships that we harbor in our hearts begin to get replaced with love and mercy. Maybe some of the goals we had in life that were, that were selfish or, or we thought that this is the only reason for my living begin to melt away and begin to be replaced by serving others and what we can do good in life. Just as Moses died mysteriously on the mountain, and just as Elijah was, was swept away in glory in that chariot of fire, so our old ways leave us when Jesus comes in our heart. And then the second effect happens right there. The, and that is we become new persons in Christ. And, and in that third verse, we saw that. Well, what was the picture of the transfiguration? Well, Jesus' garments become radiant. They, they become glowing before the disciples. It's, it's one of those mysteries of Scripture that we never fully comprehend. And, and uh, as the, the Mark says, they become white that that no bleach could ever get them out. It's something that as I read the different commentators this week, and, and they were saying, you know, some people say that this is just one of those imaginative things that, that the disciples made up after the resurrection or how they tried to explain something. But then most of them come back to say that, that there's so much detail and, and there's so much... Uh, not just symbolism, but actual fact here that to somehow, uh, like looking under that microscope at the, at the drop of water from a pond for the first time, it's something amazing that happens. That's probably never happened again. But can you imagine being there on that mountain when that happened? And it reminds us, and I hope, of what happens to us inside when Jesus comes in our heart. That we too become radiant. That we too become white, clean from our sin when Jesus enters our lives. The old life passes away, the Bible says, and we become new creatures in Jesus. We feel cleaned inside, fresh, alive. Uh, just like I said, remember a great moment in your life, and I hope it hasn't been so long ago in your memory. Can you remember when you first became a Christian? <laughs> how clean you felt? How different you felt? How amazing you felt? Even if you were a child when you came to Christ. I can still, I was only eight years old, I re, but I remember, I remember just wanting to pray and ask Jesus in my heart, and and um, I remember when one of my best friends at church came down a few weeks later and asked Jesus in his heart. For some reason, I remember even at eight or nine being uh, just, just weeping uncontrollably I, because I just knew in my heart because I had just done it, something amazing had just happened. 
I hope we don't lose that wonder. And, and, and I think that's why it's so exciting when we see, especially teenagers and adults that become Christians maybe later in life, um, don't we see that, that extra zeal, that extra wonderment, that extra glow? Because something so miraculous has happened. Jesus and us becoming clean and white and glowing, it, it reminds me of all those Tide commercials on TV. Really? You know? And man, they, they just get the dirtiest, soiled, uh, white shirt they can find, or sometimes they, they throw, you know, uh, juice on it and gunk on it, and then they put it in a washing machine with Tide, and it comes out. You know, they pull out another white shirt is what they do. But, you know, but it looks, it, it looks so white and perfect and great. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't have to do a magic trick with us, does he? Our hearts, our lives become clean, sparkling, white, glowing, just like that, to con, that uh, transfiguration. And it's the only way that inside of us can become sparkling white. There's no other way to become pure in heart and soul other than through Jesus. And it even goes further than that in that one day, like the song we sang, one day we'll have a new body in heaven. Just as Jesus was transformed, we get a glimpse of glory. And that one day when we leave this earth and we, we go to heaven to be with the heavenly Father, Paul says we'll be like him. He says that we'll put away this corruptible body and put on an incorruptible one. Yeah, I couldn't say that very well, could I? Neither could Paul. But uh, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to have some reconstructive jaw surgery coming up here in a few weeks. And um, the surgeon says that afterwards, this side will look like this side a little more. I'll get a little, little new body going on there. And I said, can it be a little Brad Pittish? Um, <laughs> And he says, yeah, I'm not a miracle worker. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go with, with what I get. But, uh, you know, but one day, you know, they won't have to take bones from your leg like they're going to do with me to give me a new jawline. But one day God will make us all perfect, won't he? Just like he did up on that mountain with that, with that glowing transfiguration. And then maybe one of the most important parts of this transfiguration is what... Um, you know, is, is what happens, what, what we hear God saying from heaven. You know, Peter says, hey, let's make a... He didn't know what to say. The Bible says they're so frightened. Can you imagine? They're so petrified. Peter says, hey, let's build a booth, a, a shelter for Elijah, for Moses, and for you, Rabbi. You're, you know, this is a great moment. And, and the voice from heaven says, as the other two disappear and overshadows them, it says, no, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Verse 7, that cloud that comes over symbolizes in the Bible the very presence of God. And that, that voice says, you know, now, you know, stop listening to every, all those other voices in your head and in your heart. Listen to Jesus, my son. He's the son of God. In our own life, it means, you know, we, we don't no, no longer need to trust and rely on things like our own desires to get us through life. We don't have to rely on our own fear. We don't, we don't have to worry and, or rely on our own conscience. We don't have to, we don't no longer have to consult man or go to the self-help section in the bookstore. We don't need to listen to, to others on what to do or, or speculate about the great mysteries we don't understand at times of heaven and earth but instead, we can go to the Gospels and we can go to what Jesus said. And if we discover who Jesus is, then we can now listen to him and believe. And, and some of the mysteries, we'll still have some, some of the mysteries of life can be revealed. We can hear Jesus as, as Jesus talks about God's peace and patience and love. Where Jesus talks about forgiveness and where Jesus speaks of, of the judgment of the world. And when Jesus maybe comes and says to us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. When Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, he shall never thirst again. When Jesus says, now go and, and do likewise, like the man did 
with the Samaritan who was robbed and his neighbor. And when Jesus says to the woman, even caught in the very act of adultery, go and sin no more. In all of those situations of life and all of those mysteries of life, the story says now we can listen to Jesus because he is the Son of God. It's that wow moment of the gospel. And even with all of that, can you imagine being Peter, James, and John that that sometimes it takes a while to, to realize what we're seeing? They see all of this, this miracle, and at the end of the story it says, they're still wondering to themselves, what is this all about? You know, it's something that's so easy that a child can understand, but sometimes it's hard for us as human beings to take it all in, isn't it? And that's where trust and faith come in. And the more you trust and the more you believe and the more faith you have, the more you can understand and the more that, that you just, and you know that have known Jesus or a long, long time. The longer your faith grows and you stay in the Word and you stay praying and you stay believing, the, the more natural it becomes. And you too hear the voice from heaven. Believe in Jesus. He's the Son of God. They all look around at the end and only Jesus remained. And you know, that's really what all of life's about. When all is stripped away, there's really only Jesus. And there's no lasting peace. There's no lasting satisfaction except when we walk with Jesus. Jesus is here. And in Jesus is our all in all. Keep believing. Keep following. And if you haven't believed and you haven't followed him in baptism, do that. Because that's where it all begins. We're going to have a prayer in a minute. And, and then let's just sing and worship and thank Jesus for what he's done. And maybe if Jesus is speaking to you to, to believe in him, to be baptized, come and talk to me about that. And, and let's take care of that for your life. Or if you just need to learn and, and remember the wonderment of following Jesus and how much he does glow and shine above everything else. Um, pray to Jesus as you sing to love him more. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for, um, for just uh, coming, Lord Jesus, and shining above everyone and everything else. It's hard for us to grasp your total meaning. It's too much for our human minds, but thank you for the spirit that begins to help us understand. May we leave this place just in awe and wonder of you. And may we build our lives around our salvation that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.